Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another one of my Podbean podcast YouTube videos on Gaudium at Spez22.com blog uh, and so on. Uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, interviews this past week, uh, some of them, you know, with uh, academics and focused on liturgy. I did Bishop, Bishop James Connolly of Lincoln uh, yesterday with Adam Bartlett. So I've been kind of all over the map, but I'm going to be starting a series now on seminaries. And to that end, I'm going to be interviewing uh, seminary rectors. And today I'm very, very excited. We have Father Keith Chelinsky, uh, who is the rector of St. Charles Seminary in St. Charles Borromeo Seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a seminary near and dear to our hearts because we've known so many young men that have gone through there who are now priests. And my wife, Carrie, uh, was once the director of the master's degree program. For, I don't know what the official name of it is, uh, Father, the, the master's, for the, the night degree program, whatever yeah, it is. Master of Arts. And, yeah. So yeah. she did that for seven or eight years. So we're very excited to have you on. Anyway, Father Chelinsky isn't just Father Chelinsky anymore. He is also Bishop-elect Chelinsky. So we'll refer to him as his high excellency, uh, most excellent. Uh, he's, but he's soon to be an auxiliary bishop in Philadelphia. He was appointed auxiliary bishop uh, last year by Pope Francis and will be officially installed I believe, March 7th, I do March believe. 7th, yes, less than yes. two weeks. And my wife will be there at your installation and to give you some in indication of how highly she thinks of you. Uh, I'm giving a lecture at uh, Catholic University on that same day. She was going to be attending that lecture with me, but no, she's going to be attending the installation of oh, a certain my heavens. I am insula <laughs> so of a certain uh, Father Chelinsky. But she loves the seminary and she loves you and very happy to have you here to discuss seminary education today. I also want to add in terms of your biography, I was sort of I was doing some uh, reconnoitering of your of your record today. And I noticed that you, you actually have a degree in, in psychology or psychotherapy or something along those lines. And you're actually uh, involved in the Catholic Psychotherapy Association and were, was a chaplain there. Correct. Uh, that you, you, you got your degree at that Institute, right? What's it called? The psychological, yes. the Institute for the psychological sciences, IPS. It was known. I, IPS. That that's yep. what I was groping for. IPS. Yep. Yep. Yes. And you're a native of, of New York's Schenectady. I do believe that's um, did you, you went to public school, right? I was a public. I went to Catholic school for kindergarten and first grade until we moved to Connecticut, where Catholic schools were not as prevalent where we live. So, uh, so yeah, I, public. I, well, I noticed it because I, too, went to public schools oh, and yet very good. some. And yet somehow yeah, ended up yeah. in the seminary. And <laughs> next week, I'm going to be interviewing Monsignor Andy Baker, uh, who is the rector of Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland, my alma mater. Anyway, OK, all the preliminaries out of the way. Thank you for coming on the show today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having okay, me. Okay, so let's just start with a very generic question here. Uh, I, I ended the seminary in 1986, so I'm, I'm getting older and older as the days go on. So, you know, that's like 40 years ago almost now. And, and so I'm assuming I often like to speak as if, oh, I know so much about seminaries because I was in one. Uh, and yet uh, my knowledge of seminaries is probably dated now at this point. So and I know a lot of my listeners and viewers are not that familiar with what goes on in, in modern day seminaries. Uh, and, and they're very concerned with the issue of priestly formation. Uh, and so what, what would you let's just begin with a very generic question. What is the state of seminary education? We'll limit this to the United States. What is the state of seminary education in the United States right now? Give, give us a general assessment, if you would. Sure. Uh, I would start by saying, having in personally been involved in the work now about for 10 years of seminary formation, that I am filled very sincerely with a lot of hope. Um, there's been a real transformation, a real change in culture. I would say, especially over these last 10 years, 10 to 15 years, um, as you know, in the church, a lot of times things thing, things take a long time to sort of trickle down and to, to renew because you basically, and especially this is the case with seminary formation, because you form people as you were formed, just like you parent people as you were parented. So if you were raised in kind of this old model, which was prevalent, I think pretty much throughout the United States, this very militaristic, 
you know, very duty based approach to you obey or you're just kicked out. You know, it was yeah. all about following the rules and and just getting by and and uh, very much like a military boot camp kind of thing. That was the mentality at a lot of places, um, including St. Charles. And um, what I see now, both through the documents that have come out of Rome and now implemented through the USCCB, it's all about relationship. You know, it's all about yeah. like the goal of seminary formation is to lead you into relationship with the Trinity, ultimately. And it's explicit about that. And it talks about the different dimensions of the person that all need to be fostered and looked at, you know, individually, uh, but, but, but then in the end synthesized and, and brought into harmony with their relationship with a living, loving God. And it's, so it's, it's a very, very different mentality, you know, that talks yeah. about, it's, it's just really a real shift. Yeah, that, 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 that's very interesting. Uh, one of the things, I mean, when I did attend seminary at Mount St. Mary's, I, I went to a minor seminary in Northern Kentucky that doesn't exist anymore, St. Pius X, it was called. It was a seminary run by the Diocese of Covington, Kentucky. It was very conservative. And it was, it was a closed campus, and it was very, like you say, that military sort of thing. Then I got to Mount St. Mary's, and it was an entirely different environment because one of the things that makes the Mount unique, and I'll talk about this with Monsignor Baker, the rector there next week, is that it sits on a college college campus, okay? mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, that that gave it a kind of more open atmosphere, which really contrasted with that more military atmosphere of my undergraduate years. Yeah, and I have to admit, I, I preferred the atmosphere at Mount St. Mary's. That's that's not to say that that more military thing didn't have its have its place as well. Um, okay, well that that's good. So you're, you're encouraged. You're encouraged by by this change that you see going on. Now, do you see that as is, it, is there uniformity in seminary formation these days? I know when I went to seminary, I mean, there were seminaries. Oh, that's a very liberal seminary or, oh, that's a very, you know, St. Charles was that's a conservative place. Mount St. Mary's, that's a conservative place. Dunwoody, that's a very conservative place. But yeah. St. Mary's in Baltimore. Oh, that's the liberal place. Theological College. Oh, that's liberal. Yeah. Um, is that still true that there's this real patchwork quilt? In, in my experience, I, I really don't see that today. I think uh, I think there, there was a Vatican visitation in the early 2000s throughout the country, and that seemed to kind of level everything off and really put people, both theologically, but also just the formational mindset, um, on a much, much more level playing field, I think, than it was uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, yeah. I think it's across the board. Uh, it's uh, I think every place that I've heard of for sure is pretty orthodox, and um, yeah, and is really growing in there. I, I think of an example. Um, you know, when I was in seminary, Saint Meinrad Seminary in Indiana mm -hmm. had a reputation of sort of being left of center, not really liberal, but left of center. Yeah. Now I just gave a lecture there last year and was just overwhelmed by the absolute profundity of, of, of its theologians and its faculty and and the orthodoxy of it and and just the intelligence of it i was shocked and i thought gosh there really are good things going on in seminaries across yeah. the board these days yeah. Yeah. so th and, and that's you know that's that's really really good to hear um so i i have heard talk uh just a few months ago of, of perhaps get, we have all these seminaries in the united states what that there's going to be some sort of consolidation of seminaries. I've heard some talk that bishops are talking about. Maybe we have too many. Maybe we need to go to just four or five seminaries, six, you know, on a regional basis. Have you heard that? And if that, if so, what do you think of that? Uh, yes, I've heard that. That's been a, a bigger uh, part of, of the conversation recently. It's been public as well. Um, I, it's kind of, to me, the, the conversation sounds very similar to the debate that a lot of dioceses have about whether we should close parishes or not. You know, yeah. and how should we consolidate? It's, and, it's, uh, and it's understandable because it's numbers driven and, and financial and, and personnel. And um, 
but I, I, I always tend to be uh, more on the optimistic, uh, pie in the sky kind of. <laughs> would that all of these seminaries be filled again you know obviously we need we need a, a real increase in vocations you know certain places are are stronger than others uh with that but i i i i'm more on the uh let's see if how we can make this this work as much as possible um yeah i'm not I'll, I'll just say i'm not a fan this is my opinion i'm not a fan of this sort of let's let's centralize let's consolidate i'm not a fan of that i think there's great value in having is, a multi Go ahead. and it is the, i'm sorry it is the vision of a church that that i think it's written i forget where but that every diocese would have its own seminary no obviously that's not yeah feasible for but that's the vision so so there's a real gift and advantage of forming men in the place where where they uh, reside or where they're preparing yeah. to be a priest. So there's something. Yeah, or, or, or pairing up at least in, in an area, too, is that where other re other local dioceses would be sending their guys there as well. So, right. you know, someone studying at St. Charles would know almost every St. Charles seminary and, and then would have this community of brother priests once and that you know what that's extremely important isn't it right Very. that you have i have a community of brother priests and, yes. and 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 so that's something that to this day i still even though i never made it to priesthood i bailed out <laughs> i i, I i'm a failure i didn't make it nope. okay and yet uh, some of the dearest friends i still have in this life our friends that I made at some, well, like Bishop Conley of Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, I interviewed him. I've interviewed him twice now. I, I mean, he and I, he was just this little John Lennon glasses, bespeckled little hippie dude off the organic farm in <laughs> seminary in his ninth, in, in, you know, a fresh convert to the faith. And now here he is all grown up and a bishop uh, <laughs> and, and you too. Right. And so there's just, and I can speak that way of him with affection because I went to the seminary with him. Oh, it's, it's the, it's, it's funny. Uh, we always have the surveys and exit interviews with the guys getting ready to be ordained. You always ask them what's going to be, what will you miss the most about leaving, about not being yeah. at the seminary? Always, always, always the fraternity, the brothers, just having that, that real closeness and friendship. That's really good. Well, that brings me to, to the next question then. Um, uh, I know I know priests, and I won't mention their names, and some of them are very, very orthodox priests, not wild-eyed, you know, um, wackos out there on the far left or even on the fringes of the far right. I know some priests who say, oh, just get rid of seminaries entirely. They're, they're based on an old-fashioned monastic model uh, of, of education for priests, and it doesn't really prepare anybody really for the reality of parish priesthood. Um, and you know, that we should just have guys studying in houses of formation, living in rectories and, you know, going to local colleges, you know, the drill, you get the idea. And I, what, what I often say to that, and then I'm going to get your comment is, yeah, that's true. I don't think seminaries are a bit of an artificial environment and are not the same as what it's like to be in a parish. And, and therefore they don't prepare you for parish priesthood, but what could, I'm often reminded of the fact that. I, I often had people tell me what it would be like to be a parent, to be a daddy, but I didn't have the faintest idea what that really meant until I actually became a daddy. And there's not a class you could take in the world that would prepare you to be a daddy. But you know what did prepare me to be a daddy? The spiritual formation I had in the seminary. <laughs> right? And yeah. so go, what, what do you think, though, of that idea? Get, just get rid of the seminaries and go to houses of formation with guys going to local colleges and living in rectories and that kind of a more, a more I, I guess, worker priest kind of a mentality. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I would say that. So, for example, we in, in, in part of our program, we have this uh, for many years. We call it the spiritual year, where even more intensely, they lived in a very close knit uh, community uh, in a more intimate setting for a whole year, and we, we there were a lot of critiques of that, saying, you know, our our priests are not being formed to be religious. And they're like, why are why are you forcing them to live in community? But if if you really look at, I'm more and more I'm looking at the church, at seminary formation, at the priesthood, at everything through the lens of family, 
And the church is a family. The seminary community is a family where you're forming all of these future fathers of the family to learn how to live as a family and then going out. So it's it's not a, an either or kind of a thing that, that they work together. I right. certainly do not believe in the closed model, uh, the old monastic closed model that we had here years ago. Um, but uh, because you need to take what you've received here, the seeds, yeah. right? the, the seeds yeah. of faith, of hope and love, the, the spirituality that you experience, the liturgical formation that you could not get just being out in the house somewhere, um, <laughs> as as well as that that sense of real uh, the brotherhood. Um, that there, there's just something very special that does happen here. I think it would be a real loss if if we just if we abandon that model altogether. Um, uh, I think so too, um, and. I also think that there is a kind of theological education that a priest needs to get that can only happen in a seminary. Right. And I don't care how good your theology department might be at a local Catholic university. It's not going to be oriented directly towards what it is that a seminarian, the kind of se theology a seminarian needs uh, to know. I, think. I agree a thousand percent. Yeah. And philosophy too. Oh, and, and philosophy as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, I when I said I went to undergraduate seminary and we studied philosophy and it was, you know, scholastic philosophy, Thomistic philosophy. Uh, and I'm not saying that's the only kind of philosophy that should be studied, but I think it is the philosophy that a seminarian should know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I absolutely do. And yet, if you go to a local university and well, we want all of our seminarians to go to, say, Temple University and get a or St. Joseph's and get and get a philosophy degree, you know, you know you know, they're not going to be getting good old fashioned, you know, Maritan, Gilson, Peeper at St. Thomas. They're not going to be getting that. So, yeah. So there's a, there's a big downside to, to, to that idea. So, yeah, I, so I'm a, I'm a fan of the, of the idea that of, of seminary education. So let's, I, I want to talk specifically now about your seminary. I know, I mean, I've no, I've, I've been affiliated with St. Charles since, let's see, Pope John Paul visited Philadelphia right after being Pope. What year was it? 1979? 79. Yeah. 79. Yeah. And I remember that was my first exposure to St. Charles. I stayed there. Uh, I was I was an undergraduate seminary and I got a, you know an invitation to go to the Civic Center, I think, and, and see him say mass. So I stayed at St. Charles. And, and so I, I and I developed friendships there with with guys. So I, I've been affiliated with St. Charles. So I have to say. I'm, I'm a little bit pained in my soul that you guys are selling the property that you a beautiful, historic old property right in the main line of Philadelphia. And you're moving to a new building, uh, Gwynedd Mercy uh, College in Gwynedd Mercy, Pennsylvania. Um, speak to that a little bit. I mean, obviously, you're downsizing. Right. And what will be your capacity for for seminarians at the new facility? The yeah, we're downsizing from 74 acres to 16 acres. Uh, it's obviously a much smaller footprint. Um, the rooms will on the will have uh, 20 available on our offsite campus where we do the propedeutic year, and then we'll have a hundred about 140 uh, rooms oh. to start in the at the Gwinnett campus. So, so we well, that's to great be able to accommodate 160, which is which would be a great number for us to have. We're kind of in that 140, 150 range right now. That's about what Mount St. Mary's was when I was there. But I I know where you are right now, what, what's the capacity? I mean, if you're 400, 500? You, well, during the baby boom, you had, it was, I, I think, close to 600. They, oh. they, they had the, the barrack style things. Oh, my gosh. You see these old pictures. I mean, that just seems like a fantasy now, right? A whole different era of the church. Did you have 600 seminarians all in, in, in one place? Uh, but anyway, yeah, let's hope that that you fill the new facility at Gwinnett. And obviously, for those listening who don't know, I mean, this was done because for large, I think largely for financial reasons, so many of the old buildings there where you sit now are in, you know, they're in need of renovation and repair. Yeah, and uh, so so much deferred maintenance and you know they did the best they could with a lot of things but it was just it was just too much to upkeep 
Yeah. And uh, things like old boilers and windows and roofing and wiring. <laughs> I am. I, I, uh, one aspect of the move that uh, I'm certainly grieving, you know, the loss of, of, of this campus, but I am looking forward to not having roof leaks, you know, and, and, and yeah. actually having efficient windows and heating and yeah. all that stuff but on a practical level. Yeah. Definitely. I'm a little bit jealous because they've renovated the dormitory that I stayed in at Mount St. Mary's Seminary because when I was there, <laughs> it was ra oh, those heat, the steam radiators in the room that made those banging noises all night long. Oh, yes. And it, th there were only two temperatures that it had freezing and nine million degrees. So <laughs> when those things were banging all night, you'd open the window to your room in the dead. Of <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> So those are the kinds of upgrades that take money, you know, yeah. and and so on. But anyway, let's 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 move on to. to OK, so that's kind of where seminaries are now and uh, where you guys are going to be moving to and so on. A couple of, I think, um, more, perhaps a, a, a few more controversial things. Number one, what are seminarians like today? I mean, I've I've been reading a lot of things that say. In general, American seminarians are trending more and more and more. I don't know what term you want to use. Traditionalist, conservative. Uh, these categories are a bit hackneyed, you know, and aren't necessarily accurate. But I think you get a sense of what I'm talking about. Number one, is that true? And number two, if it is true, what sort of is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing or is it a mixed bag? What kind of challenges does that then propose to the seminar. So, for example, you've got a lot of seminarians who think that I, I want to say the traditional Latin mass and I think the Novus Ordo, the bogus Ordo, you know, and all that kind of stuff is, is no good. Uh, like, so you, you get the sort of dynamic I'm talking about here. Does it, what, what's going on with young seminarians these days and how are they confronting the turmoil that's in the church today? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would start with. Um... You certainly can't generalize because each guy is unique and, and each journey of vocation is unique. But in terms of general trends, I would say this first. Um, these guys are very, very, on the whole, transparent and engaging formation. Like they're, they're coming with a hunger uh, almost that I see for healing, for uh, like genuine authentic conversion um and are very very open in talking to formators and and from what i understand spiritual directors and and counselors and i i was in that role before becoming rector i was in the counseling role i was just always so edified by how guys just genuinely openly transparently uh, availed themselves to the formation process you know wow. and some, some guys more than others of course and that's part of the journey is you really want trying to develop a, an atmosphere of trust and safety so they really can have the right to be open in, in the right you know for wow you know what i'm going to pause for a second right there because i said at the beginning there might be differences between my own seminary and today that is so refreshing for me to hear because it's the exact opposite of the experience I had. Our experience was you want to hide as much as you can from the formators. Yeah. yeah. Hide and survive. You know? Yeah. Hide. And, that's a good, yeah. You wanted to hide and survive because you didn't trust the formators. Yeah. Uh, you, you thought that they all had it out for you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so you just wanted to fly under the radar till you got ordained. Yeah. So that's, that's good to hear uh, yeah. that there's this trans go ahead. Really, oh, I'm sorry, very much so. And so that's getting back to that initial point I made about this all like the seminary being about relationship very much. This is coming out of the Ratio from 2016 and seeing, yeah. yeah, like the idea of a formator today is really seeing him as a mentor, uh, truly as a mentor in, in every way. Someone like using that, the word that's used a lot, but it's very, very good in this context, accompaniment. You know, like you really want to get to know a guy and 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 the guy in his openness really wants to be known. And and so it's a really it's a beautiful journey that that happens when, when these these guys avail themselves like that. Well, that's good. And, and it could be, too, because 
the the kind of young man entering into seminaries today might be because of our culture because of the decline of our culture might be actually a more fractured and wounded human being psychologically than seminarians of old i'm thinking especially in terms of things like pornography uh i i once talked to a seminary formator i won't mention his name and i asked him about this question and he said, Larry, if we were to reject every single seminarian who comes in today because they had a porn habit, you know, in the recent past, we would not have any candidates for the priesthood. Uh, and obviously, I don't want you to speak about specific, you know, or divulge it. But is, is, is this something the seminary has had to address? Let's, let's put it that way. Yeah, for sure. And I, especially in my previous role as, as counselor and did a lot in human formation, um, there's a, with a, there's a lot of resources that have sprung up, thank God, <clears throat> over the last 10 years. And we've made use of a lot of those things just for, even for education. And that it's, it's such a scourge it's, and it's so prevalent in today's world um, that even if a guy's not struggling with it personally, pastorally, he really n- needs to know how to confront this and how to help people yeah. who are coming to him. But there's there's a lot of resources that we've engaged to 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 help guys. Well, and that's think, an interesting. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. And I think, but in the in the bigger um, picture of this, uh, I think certainly we have, and I've seen a lot of other seminaries too, are much more intentional and capable in really helping guys in their chastity formation, like really understanding what it is, really encouraging it. Yeah. In, and and um, you know um, creating a culture that's really like striving for that, and there's there's so many different ways you can do that. That is so key that it because you know we we it, our, we don't live in a culture that promotes chastity. <laughs> I mean, no, it's so countercultural. It's so so contrary to the culture today to promote chastity and so many guys coming into the seminary and i know that when i went to seminary even though pornography was not at all an issue especially you know the internet stuff uh there were guys who came into the seminary who were still the victims of the sexual revolution who had had multiple promiscuous sexual relationships and so on uh you know coming into the seminary that had scarred them and, you know, had made them not quite as chaste as they should be. So that that's, that's good to hear with regard to the transparency and the programs. And you made a point that I think is very important, that it's important for seminaries to address this issue, not because the men themselves need to be healed of this, uh, but they're going to have to deal with it. I, I know there's a, a priest up in Allentown. I think he's a graduate of St. Charles, Father Alan Hoffa, mm-hmm. uh, do you know Alan, Father I Alan sure Hoffman? Yeah. He yeah. Was here my time. yeah. Oh, yeah. Great guy. Great priest. I love that big guy. He's been <laughs> up here to our farm, but he's doing a ministry now uh, for for, you know, people addicted to pornography. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's essential today. It really is. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, and so I would that would that more priests were trained and I'm, but they're going to hear it in the confessional. That's for sure. At some uh, point. So it's a, it's a true. Well, let's move on to, to you know, the idea, though, to, to get back to the other point I'm making liturgically. This this is an obsession of mine. So pardon me if I'm going to ride my own hobby horse here and drive this into the ground. Uh, but I mean, I'm going to be blunt. Are there a lot of seminarians that prefer the old mass to the to the mass of Paul the sixth? Is that is that a problem? Is that an issue? I don't. Uh, my experience here, I don't see it as a problem. I do see it as a phenomenon. Uh, it, it does seem that a greater majority, again, I don't want to blanket it because a lot of guys are not interested in the extraordinary form, but I would say a greater percentage are compared to when I was in the seminary or when you were in the seminary. So um, it's, it's definitely something that's out there. Um, but I think, I think the key is to be able to, with good, with good theological training, and uh, rooting oneself in Vatican II documents and, and so forth, you, you, it, it, it helps to um, not polarize the issue so much that it's there yeah. can be some of the favorite or something like that, that, that actually, okay, you know, I might have a preference for, um, you know, the extraordinary form, which is fine. And we don't try to squelch that uh, as long as they're, they see the, the, the validity of the Novus Ordo and and the pastoral sensitivity 
to to work with people who might not have the same proclivities as you do, you know, and not seeing that this is the only way. Um, what I do see is a, a underneath it, though, aside from a, a a preference for extraordinary form, more universally, what I'm seeing is just guys who want a very who want reverence in liturgy. Period. Through just through beauty, through through good music, and 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 just the celebration of it in a good. And that would be the vast majority of seminarians, you would yeah, say? It's, for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Once again, another difference between when I was when I was in seminary in the 80s, the seminary was evenly divided right down the middle between yeah. let's ha let's have guitars and St. Louis Jesuits yeah. and, and all that versus let's have mass in Latin with, you know, with with chant and so on. And, yeah. and the, the divide was often quite bitter. Yeah. Uh, so. Fortunately, I'm so I'm glad to hear that that divide has gone away. And it points to something you said earlier that I think is important. One of the reasons why seminaries continue to have their their validity is that they prepare guys liturgically. I mean, if I had not had my experience in the seminary of Novus Ordo liturgies of a very high order that were extremely well done and beautiful, I may never have thought that it was possible. Mm -hmm. you know, for that, for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, understood. understood. And, yeah. And also, you know, the morning and evening prayer together and all those kinds of things that, that kind of liturgical formation, I think is extremely important as well. I, you know, and, and, and it was all Novus Ordo. So I, I, I learned in seminary that it's possible to have the mass of Paul the sixth and have it be beautiful and reverent. But that brings me to another point, which is, well, why, uh, why I asked, are, are most seminarians like this now? Because it, it does seem to me that there is this, uh, to, be, to be a bit controversial here, there, there does seem to be a current emphasis in the church by some in positions of high authority, that the church is just supposed to be this endlessly changing constantly changing entity, chameleon-like entity that shifts and moves with the times and so on, uh, because that's what the people of today want and expect is this fluid, malleable church that, you know, meets people where they are. And yet it seems to me that the pastoral reality on the ground is the opposite. It seems to me that what young people, and it wouldn't just be seminarians, but young people in general, are looking for is the eternal, the transcendent, the stable, that which does not change. Everything in their culture, it changes. Their whole experience is of life as, as Heraclitus on steroids, of, of, you know, endless, endless change. And now the church is, this, is supposed to be this, that way, too. I, 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 so it's encouraging to me here that seminarians are looking for that kind of reverence in, in, in the liturgy and so forth. I mean, do you share my, that pastoral assessment of mine that that's what young people are looking for today? Uh, I, I, I do. And I, I, we, I just had a conversation recently about that in terms of whether it's liturgy or, or, or other things, you know, the young people today are looking for stability. They're looking for that rock really to, to fix one yeah. on. And when they find it in the church, they, 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 they really run to it with, with great zeal. And uh, so I, I think, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's a scary, vulnerable world out there, you know, and I think yeah. it's, it's hard for us to understand with the, the whole social media phenomenon, like, what would it be like? You're, you're insecure enough as an adolescent, you know, when it gets magnified through, social media it's it could be very very unsettling you know in one's life and, uh, yeah um, obviously you want to be you want to have a pastoral soul and you want to be patient with people and sure. accompany yeah. them and all the those things about discernment uh, every priest knows what i'm talking about but all of that is on is on the is on the surface of what must be a deeper commitment to something eternal and true and unchanging Absolutely. And that kind of brings me to, to one of my final points here that I want to bring up. And, and obviously, I'm going to plug my own discipline. I, I just can't emphasize enough the importance of good theology and that seminaries, God bless the seminaries of today that seem to be, 
you know, really doubling down on, on good theology. Does Father Pazacic still teach at St. Charles Seminary? Uh, by yes, the way? he does. He's the, he's the veteran professor, I believe, at this point. <laughs> well, tell him I said hi and that Carrie says hi. He's, he's been in our living room, actually, in, in Allentown uh, <laughs> a, a few times back when Carrie still worked there. I love that guy. But I, I, I think of him because he's brilliant and he teaches brilliant theology. And one of my frustrations, and I want you to speak to this because I think it's important. One of my frustrations when I was in seminary was how many of my fellow seminarians seemed anti-intellectual, uh, anti-theology, that um, I just need to get through these four years, get my degree, and then I'm never going to crack open another book. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, because what does this have to do with what I'm going to be doing as a priest? And I think that's uh, I, I'm very short-sighted. Is that is there still a kind of undercurrent of that in the seminary today, do you think? I think, yeah, it's in my time they call it C is for collar, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's a good one. That's yeah. a good one. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm sure it's there. I, I don't hear that explicitly, uh, but I know that some priests espouse that. Um, I do see a friendly uh, tension uh, among the priest formators, because each sort of has their own emphasis that they're working in. You know, the spiritual is most important. The human is, you know, the the intellectual is. Yeah. And, you know, as rector, I'm trying to I'm trying to see the whole picture and seeing how all of them are to are interdependent and and should be. Yes. Sent, you know, and so yes. that's very much how the way I simply frame it when I talk to the guys, I say. The more you love someone, the more you want to know about them. And then the more you know about them, the more you love them. And it, so it should go hand in hand. So study is not antithetical to yeah. priest formation. It should actually feed it uh, and enhance it. You know, That's, um, that was my thought. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I the, and the theology that I do, I mean, that I'm devoted to that I've spent my life promoting and studying is the theology of uh, you know, resource month, the theology of people like Gordini, Balthazar, Ratzinger, Bouye, de Lubach. And, and the point is, as you well know, is that they sought to bring theology and sanctity, theology and spirituality back together because they had yes. kind of been divided. The old scholastic, neo scholastic manuals, God bless them, they had their place and they did bring clarity and a certain uniformity of formation, but they were dry and they were arid and they didn't they were deductive and syllogistic and didn't really connect with the spiritual life and so my whole theological career has been, been about theologians that seek to connect the spiritual back to the theological so i absolutely love what you just said about when you love someone you want to know more about them you know and the more you know about them the more you love them um absolutely. and and also i think that there's been, uh, I know that my uh, my friend, Father John Gribowicz, a priest of the Diocese of Brooklyn. Do you know Father Gribowicz by any no, chance? Of course, everybody knows the Grib, right? <laughs> everybody knows Grib, as we call him. But he has been involved in, um, and, and others that I know, in various uh, institutes or formation groups trying to create uh, better homilies, better homiletics uh, from priests. And the reason why I bring that up in conjunction to, to this conversation about theology is it seems to me that they go together. You know, that you, you, nemo dot quod non habit, you can't give what you don't have. And if you don't have Lexio Divina, a meditative prayer life on theological things, then you're not really going to have much to say in your homilies. Uh, and so I think those two things go together. So what kind of an emphasis is there at the seminary in connecting sort of homiletics and theology? And like you were just talking about that whole integrated sort of approach to things. Yeah, it's uh, and actually our, our friend, Father Tom Daly, is just spearheading this, oh, this yes. uh, Catholic preaching institute he's starting here. Um, but it's it, it's it's. It, it's it's totally interconnected. And I, I, I'll start by saying this when I've talked to the guys in my class, I say, do you know what you're communicating when you're preaching? And it, and it goes way beyond contact. He said, you know, the thing that's touching people usually first is your faith. You're communicating when you preach, you're communicating whether you believe this stuff. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Or is this just going to be an ac academic treatise? You know, and although there's place for for catechetical preaching, but but even with catechetical preaching, it's coming. You, it's from a place of I'm on fire, and I want you to know this. You know, it's you're 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 communicating your whole person, including your own relationship with the triune God, as as you're trying to bridge them and bring them into the mystery, right? That's like the division, the, the ultimate goal. Doing that, it it's necessary, and I'm very encouraged, like the documents today, very explicit about Lexio. It's very explicit about from the very beginning of, of formation and really penetrating the scriptures and really meditating with them. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a big piece. I'm very encouraged too. We we have an excellent scripture department, and um, from what I heard, Kelly Anderson, Kelly a good Anderson, friend of mine. Oh yeah, Senior Mike McGee, Father Frank Jaffre. Just we just yeah. have a great Father Brady. Um, they, what's wonderful about that that department in particular is they they always are teaching the scripture through not just through uh, an academic lens, but also through the pastoral lens and particularly ordered toward preaching. So yeah. it all goes together. And so we, we have a pretty, we have a really good um, harmony, I think, between these different components that, that really help form the guys. I saw it's so, it's so important. Yeah, I know Kelly Anderson. I knew all those other guys you mentioned too, but I just been talking to Kelly. So she, she, and she's good friends with she's Carrie. So and also, how could I not have brought up Father Tom Daly, my old <laughs> Tom? You know, uh, uh, those listening don't know what I'm talking about, but Father Daly is an oblate of St. Francis de Sales. And he, for, he went to De Sales University where I taught as a student. Then he was faculty there but he hired me it was father daly that hired me at de sales university uh and so he's responsible for the disaster that i am now <laughs> <laughs> whatever havoc i have wreaked on the world is father daly's fault but please give father daly my my fondest regards but Certainly anyway not. so the hum the thing about homiletics really gets under my skin uh because you know i'm a teacher i was a teacher and Obviously, there were days where I wasn't really all that prepared because of this and the other thing. But if your preparation is remote, is, is in, if, if, your, if your remote preparation is sufficient and enormous, then you're going to be able at times from now and then to, to in a sense, wing it, to just go up and let the spirit move you and speak. But if there's no water in that well, because you really didn't study, what do you go if you're going to wing it because you're busy and you're and sometimes legitimately so like I got called to the hospital last night because a longtime parishioner's mother is dying and I was up all night and I, I, I was planning on writing my homily last night. I didn't get a chance to, you know, and but that's why you need to study theology and pray and do lectures so that you can and, and then have the ability to speak extemporaneously, to stand up. And like you said, to share with your person is your faith to say, I'm not really prepared in my homily today because here's why, yep. you know, and here's what I was doing last night. And then speak on that. Yep. Homilize on that. I don't know. I'm really on a rant now, but. Uh, <laughs> no, I I just, I'll, I'll share with you when I it's 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 again, it's that living, loving relationship with the triune God who's going to lead us through the day to day grind, through the ups and downs through busyness yeah. or times of slowness. But if you're, if you're plugged in, you know, if you're really engaged, if you're connected, if you're in love with God, it's just, it's going to fuel everything, whether you have great orator skills or not, it's that faith that gets communicated. And I've experienced it, it, in ministry, I've had some of those weeks where legitimately I've just, I was just nonstop. Yeah. Week and I was like, you know, I, and it was funny. I, sometimes in those instances, I've given homilies and people said, that was one of your best homilies. <laughs> yeah. Like the Lord, and in a sense, the Lord's writing your homily as you're, as you're working sometimes. And it's, yeah, it's like some of my best lectures were the ones I was least prepared for. And I just went in and said, <laughs> okay, here's the deal. And boom, and it turned out to be great. So, yeah. but the but that's because the preparation is there. The soil. There was a is lot of there. hard work, so to speak, before. Yeah, and and yeah. That, 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 that we're we're kind of uh, 
running a little bit out of time, but uh, if you can stay a few more minutes, I there is a crisis in the church today. Uh, I mean, at least in terms of the raw statistics, right? The metrics, all the Pew research is the, the number of non-religious people, the so-called nuns is now up to 29%. Uh, the percentage of Catholics who go to mass on a Sunday continues to go down. Marriages and baptisms continue to go down. Parishes are closing and consolidating and so on. Uh, and I don't want to be uh, all doom and gloom here. That's not the point. The point is, how are you preparing the seminarians of tomorrow? I mean, not the, semin- the, the priests of tomorrow, the seminarians of today. How are you preparing them, in a sense, for the challenges that, that are ahead in terms of uh, an increasingly unbelieving world and an, in- an increasing sense of the church hemorrhaging people despite our best efforts? Is, is is that something that you address in your formation with with seminarians you know how to how to deal with this kind of difficult demographic let's put it that way yeah it's and uh, i would start by saying it it does go back to the the basic you know uh fundamentals like in any sport what's going to convert the most it's it's a it's a heart on fire in love with god yes. and one whose mind is uh, conformed to truth and, and one who, who appreciates and leads people to beauty. You know, the, the, when you just, that, that it's the fundamental uh, thing. It, it, so it can't, that has to be at the heart. If that's not there, programs come and go, strategies come and go, right? It's, it's all about your own living loving encounter. But in the more particular, it's interesting, our archbishop, this is a high priority in his vision um, in Philadelphia about evangelizing, particularly the youth, um, but really having an outward facing church. So we don't just stay self-referential and, and look in. We're, we're reading this book um, by uh, Monsignor Shea, the, from uh, Christendom to Apostolic. Oh, gosh, what a great book from it's Christendom to Apostolic. Book. And there's a follow-up book now, too. There's a second book. Oh, is there? Hang on. Uh, I, I've got it right here. It's called, I just got it. I haven't read it. The Religion of the Day, sequel to From Christendom to Apostolic oh, Mission. Good. Uh the religion of the day sequel to from oh, very Christian. good. So oh. university of Mary. Uh, and what I would recommend to people, I'm glad you brought this up. These are small books easily read. And the first one is called from Christendom to apostolic mission. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I haven't read this one yet, but the first one is just magnificent. And I would highly recommend people get them and read. But anyway, I interrupted you. So go ahead. Well, it's all right. We're actually, and we're having a workshop, our sort of formation workshop of, of the spring semester is going to be based on this idea. Um, and what is what does the evangelizing church look like today? And how do we need any kind of pastoral, the archbishop says like a pastoral conversion, a mindset, instead of just sort of maintaining and just yeah, just maintenance staying, Catholicism, maintenance and staying focused on, you know, my orthodoxy, but not like not ever going out and sharing about what I know and, and who, who the Lord is. And so having that sort of generosity of spirit and uh, an outward facing um, view. Yeah. To not be defensive, to be more yes. proactive. No. Uh, well, I, I joke around a lot. You know, the, you know, all these dioceses around the country, they all they, over the past 20, 25 years, many of them have held synods or you know, diocesan synod, and they all have fancy names like coming alive in the spirit, synod 2015, you know, the diocese of XYZ. And really all they are is let's get together and discuss which parishes we're going to close. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And right. all of that is designed to simply give the bishop cover when he closes the parishes he was going to close anyway. <laughs> So that's the synodal church at work, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, But that's I joke about it, because to me, those sorts of gestures, though, uh, though, perhaps probably necessary. And you're going to find this out as a bishop very soon. uh, uh, They're rear guard actions. They're they're actions in, uh, you know, burning bridges behind us as we retreat. (laughs) So, you know, and and but we need a more proactive church, you know, a, a church that's out there 
outward. I like what you said, outward facing. Outward facing, yeah. And I, I would say to the guys, love by its nature is expansive. Love by its nature is is always expanding. It's always going this direction. And so wow. the, yes, it's not a time to retreat. You know, there's plenty in the world to discourage us, and certainly plenty that we've seen in the church to discourage us. But it doesn't change the fact that love still exists and it's God. And the more yeah. we're plugged in, the more we the more we can be vulnerable and receive the love. I, I would say, you know, formation is really learning how to let God love you. And that's yeah. that's not the hide the stuff. That's the that's the transparency and let him in. And once you've really let him love you for who you are, not for who you're performing to be, it's like you're golden. It's like that just becomes that wellspring that just wants to go out. That just it's like wow. an instinct. You know? That is that's beautiful. Somebody should make you a bishop. I think <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really good because it. I mean, it's good because I agree with it completely, and it agrees with me. So that means it's good. But no, that's love is love is expansive. I love that. That is everything that I've been on about for my entire theological career. Love yeah. is expansive, and what it points to is yeah, what we're going through as a church right now. It's painful. It's it's no fun watching institutions die. Uh, Catholic hospitals closed down, Catholic schools closed down, Catholic parishes closed down, Catholic universities go under, you know, that's no fun. And you yourself are experiencing the pain of that right now, where you're in this historic property that just can't be sustained anymore. Yep. So you've got to make the painful decision to, you know, go to something smaller and more sustainable. And yet at the same time, it represents a unique opportunity for St. Charles Borromeo Seminary to remake itself, yep. you know? To be to be remade in his love and in his image and it's you know the buildings come and go and in the end again it is hard to leave this place but in the end this this i have just so much um gratitude and hope in seeing the guys that are here there's just so much goodness love sincerity and that same goodness love and sincerity is going to be at gwen next year and yeah that's that's what it's about it is what it's about. And extrapolating from that to the church at large, yes, the church is in a crisis, but I'm not dystopian about this. Yeah, we're going to, you know, Ratzinger saw it in 1967. The church is going to get smaller and it's going to shrink, and but it's going to be a smaller and holier church. And the, the basic apostolic constitution, hierarchical constitution, sacramental constitution of the church will remain. And at the same time, it, the church is given a great opportunity to re to re dash form itself yep. uh, for a new world, and that's kind of exciting to be on the. We, we live in exciting times. It's kind of exciting to be on the. You know, I'm old. I'll, I'll be dead soon, as a priest friend of mine says. <laughs> <laughs> you know, him, Father Mike Kerper. He's uh, a Mountie like me. He's a priest in Nashua, New Hampshire. Yeah. He's been saying since he was 29. You know, we'll be dead soon. <laughs> 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 Well, I said to him the other day, because he's about 71 or two, I said, you know, Mike, uh, we really will be dead soon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so let's stop joking about it. That's not, right. It's not so fun. But that's the point. The transitoriness of our existence yeah. is something that, that we do have to write. We have to write Christ into the transitoriness of our existence. And uh, that's what seminary formation these days has got to be about, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I think that's perhaps a good way to end. I don't want to presume too much of your time. I man, it's uh, this is the first time you and I have actually met. My wife's met you before, uh, but it's been an absolute delight, a joy. I hope our paths cross again. I do, too, very much. And, so. and, and much. I'll be praying for you on March 7th Thank when you. your installation is as auxiliary bishop in Philadelphia. You'll probably be the next Cardinal of Chicago someday and then right on up into the papacy. So you're on your way now, sir. Yeah, you just get ready. I know it's busy enough as it is. <laughs> well, um, do you have any last words before we sign off, Father? No, I just thank you. I just want to say to you, it's this how love is expansive. The very fact that you're doing this podcast is a sign of that. That love is expansive. Oh. Wanting to thank, well, thank you very much because uh, I do a lot of these things. And people think, oh, you know, it's how hard can it be to sit and just have a conversation with somebody? But it's actually exhausting. You do have to prepare uh, on a wide variety of topics. And why do I do it? I do it because I love the church. 
Yeah. And, uh, and I really do. It's just my ministry. It's what I do. So actually, I thank you for that. I'm not going to engage in false humility. It is why I do what I do, uh-huh. you yeah. know, and, and uh, so thank you. But anyway, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you to everybody uh, for listening. And as I said, everybody out there, please pray for Father Twinsky, who will soon be Auxiliary Bishop of Philadelphia on March 7th. Pray for him because he's going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. All right. Thanks again. Thanks.